welcome to On The Media's very first live stream ever. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Joe Baker, a member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. Our guest is Secretary Madeline Albright, Brian Cranston, Tank and the Bangas, Barry Jenkins, Celia Keenan Bolger, Aaron Lee Carr, S. Bronza Spalding, Gideon Glick, Helen Yoyemi, Fab Five Fred, Benga Akanabe, Brene Brown, Tony Goldwyn, Tandy Newton, Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Welcome to all of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. What a pleasure. Hi. Hi. This is so fun. I'll see you tomorrow. We're here every day, 12 to 2. The impromptu concert. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I was there for the love of it. You must tell the truth. I'm sure everyone's perspective is unique. There's a lot of truth about the pain of being an immigrant, mm. but they're jokes. We find the funny. It's our strength. At what point do you think women's health care will stop being a political issue? When half of Congress can get pregnant. We ran out of words, but we do what we do. We mm. don't have no words, so we go up to trade twos. So we trade twos, I was just really dope groove. And Allison was so nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to Get Lit with All of It, our book club event. We are so excited you could be with us tonight and enjoy some conversation and stop doom scrolling for a little bit. I'm Allison Stewart. For those of you who don't know me, I host the Afternoon Arts and Culture Show on WNYC every day from 12 to 2 on demand whenever you like. I hope you'll join us. And for those of you who listen every day, hi, I'm glad to see you. Glad you could be here. Uh, and also, you should follow us on Instagram, at all of it WNYC, because that is actually where we host our book club discussions in between these live events. It can be very exciting. It gets a little bit feisty. People get into it. I have to tell you already, we have lots of comments coming in, and we have had all month. Because this is a kind of a special get lit. Our partners, the New York Public Library, had a terrific program in December, which was Roar for New York. The idea was to celebrate our city and its resilience. And as a part of that, there was a book list of 125 books about New York we love. And so we picked one of them. It's a book that we loved. Motherless Brooklyn by Jonathan Latham. We know we've all been reading it and we're going to talk to Jonathan in just a little bit. Because it's kind of a special evening, we have two special guests, two very different and wonderful musicians from New York City. Uh, one picked by Jonathan at a $75 bill, the duo. I know they're listening in. Hi. And at the end of the end of the whole event, we're going to hear from Jordana Lee from Lincoln Center. She has some really interesting news about Lincoln Center. She's going to give us to us exclusively tonight. That's exciting. And then a performance that was made specifically for essential workers in New York City. So we have a whole lot coming up. We'll also announce our next book club, which some of you may know already, but we'll give it the big anyway. But let's get on to the main event. Jonathan Lethem's Motherless of Brooklyn. As you know, it's a perfect book for a book club celebrating New York. You talk about the Upper East Side. We got Greenpoint. We've got Brooklyn. Let me tell you how many people were able to check out the book from the library uh, because of our partnership with the New York Public Library. 3,473 of you checked out a copy of Motherless Brooklyn. You also might want to check out Jonathan's new novel called The Arrest. It's kind of wild. But the book we're talking about tonight is Motherless Brooklyn, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for fiction. Jonathan Lethem, welcome. Thank you. It's so fun to be part of this. Thanks for having me. 
When you were on our show in December, we had a little preview of this event, and you said that Motherless Bookland is a book you always enjoy revisiting and talking about. Why do you think you have such a, a fond relationship with the story? Well, I, I mean, it's a feedback loop. It's always been the book of mine that I think has inspired the most, by, really by far the most affection. Uh, you know, people want to know Lionel. They want to hang out with Lionel. In fact, sometimes I feel like I'm expected to be as fun as Lionel and I'm kind of a disappointment to people because I made up somebody who's more lovable I think then um, certainly than myself and, and, you know, maybe then the average fictional character, certainly for me, my characters tend to have a little bit uh, of a, of an edge, be a bit disaffected or, or, um, or alienated or difficult, but Lionel, there's something about him that leans toward the reader. And, and so the, the embrace of this character in my experience means that people are lit up in a particular way when they want to talk to me about this book. And that's just always been a kind of a, a treat for me. A, a, a kind it's of nourishment. Really, it was really fun to read, especially with the idea of this framing of loving New York, because we recognize the streets names and we recognize the Upper East Side. And there's a, a reference. I, I went in the time back machine, way back machine, J and R music world, <laughs> where he's getting a cassette for his, his Walkman. Uh, does the book, when you reread it, I don't know if you reread it recently, um, is it really, did you mean to make a time capsule? Well, so the context for my writing, Motherless Brooklyn, was I'd been living away from, from New York for my whole uh, young adulthood, all through my 20s. And my first four novels were written in California, and they we're all really not about New York. I'd sort of avoided this really prominent main part of my own life and experience. And then in the late nineties, I moved back to New York city and kind of began to fall in love with it and also connect to it in a different way where I realized how much it formed me and it formed my language and it formed my way of thinking and my, my personality. So the book is a kind of um, a mash note. It's a big Valentine upon this return you know i was just seeing the streets of brooklyn with this unbelievably affectionate uh eye and and i wanted to catalog a lot of what i loved i wanted to sort of name things uh for what they were you know to talk about the the sandwiches and the the the, the streets and the 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 language of the streets the the vernacular um and catch some of what uh what meant so much to me it was interesting as I stumbled on that one page. I'm stuck on the JNR Music World because it is such of a of a moment. And I thought, wow, could could you have told this story in 2018, or has the internet made that impossible? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They would have been well, able to find out yeah. everything about the characters. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff that's that's uh, that's now it's now a historical novel. But that's what you know mm -hmm. fiction does is it freezes contemporary life and and you can sort of see how much it's changed uh i mean in a very particular way of course the internet and and cell phones make writing crime stories really difficult now a lot of the ways that people are ordinarily like in the dark and looking for clues or wondering uh, whether people are good or bad you know now you would just kind of google them and and you can't really um be out of out of contact with people the way you used to be. I, I think it's really tough for um, for serious writers of of mysteries and and thrillers. Although I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm really just kind of a in this book especially I'm just I'm just playing with the form. Um, but um, the other thing that's changed and I think it's really uh, changed profoundly is that people are much more familiar with uh, Tourette syndrome than mm -hmm. they were when I you know set out to write it, it was something that could still really surprise you. It, it had surprised me. I only learned about it a few years before I began researching it, before I became fascinated with it and began researching it for the book. And now some kind of corner was turned and uh, there were a certain number of characters in television shows and, and movies and you know memoirs by people with Tourette's and celebrities with Tourette's who were open about it. And I think it's, you could never write about it the way, quite the way I did where everyone seems to be mm -hmm. learning about it only because Lionel exists. We got so many questions about Tourette's and about how you came to it and your experience with it. I'm curious about 
from your research, what in your research helped you create Lionel and help create his particular ticks? Well, so the first thing I should explain is that I, I, I found out about Tourette's by reading um, essays by Oliver Sacks. And he's got two different case studies, one in The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat and another one in a book called An Anthropologist on Mars. And each of these are so <laughs> compelling to me and they were so overwhelmingly interesting to me because there was something about Tourette's as soon as I learned about it from, from Sacks' writing that seemed to reach into me, it seemed to speak to me, which is not the same thing as saying that I was self-diagnosing because I don't think that anyone would would diagnose me as having Tourette syndrome, but there was something about it as a description of a neurological experience, a relationship to language and a, a kind of reactivity that I did feel that I was discovering something or, a, or considering a description that, that amplified my sense of myself. And so I did have to research it and I did everything I could to surround myself with information and, and description and to meet people with with Tourette's and let them talk to me and inform me. But I, I never would have begun that journey into research if it hadn't also in some sense been a responsive uh, moment for me where I felt, oh, there's this, somehow this involves me, even though it doesn't seem to, uh, I'm, I'm drawn into a relationship to it that's personal. We asked our readers, we do these Instagram questions out. All right, we asked our readers how they thought Lionel's Tourette's enhanced or complicated this detective story. One person wrote to say, quote, it added verbal texture to the narration. Another wrote, readers and characters trust him because they think he has no choice but to speak his mind. How do you think Tourette's helps Lionel as a detective? I like that. I like both of those descriptions very much. And that last one, the, the sense that he's, in a, he's almost wearing his brain on the outside, that anyone can, can meet him and sort of uh, experience what he's thinking. You know, one of the origin points for my, uh, my idea, to, my notion of putting Tourette's together with the traditional hard-boiled detective story was that I, as a great fan of you know, Humphrey Bogart movies and Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler and Ross MacDonald, it seemed to me that the signature characteristic of the hardball detective is their verbal mastery. You know, this is a character who's uh, in the dark. They don't know what the plot is. There's, there are invisible forces. They're outgunned and outnumbered by both the police and the criminals, and they tend to exist in a space somewhere between those two. But the one thing they have, and this is very typical of Bogart's portrayal of the hard-boiled detective in The Big Sleep and, and Maltese Falcon, is that they walk into any given room and they kind of run verbal rings around the other characters. They have command. Their wisecracks and their, their interrogation and their sarcasm, you know, that's what makes them who they are. And in a way, that's what it is to be hard-boiled. And so the idea of a character who was the almost the ultimate opposite of this. It was like a soft-boiled detective. He had no verbal control. He was almost at the mercy of language in every situation and in every scene. It struck me as a, a very funny idea and also one that would make the mechanics of the detective story um, really visible in an interesting way. You would see how uh, the idea of this character entering a room and interrogating or trying to learn things or trying to command the people around them uh, really operated. I have to ask you about how you came up with the string of words that would be in Lionel's ticks. Because I had, there were different ones that just, I, I kept I kept marking which ones I liked. And there was one, one when he and Tony are talking about, and Tony's talking about Batman, and Batman always gets away, the supervillain will never learn. And Lionel says, Uncle Batman, I shouted. That couldn't know how much work it was for me to keep my hands on the dashboard, my neck straight. This is one just made, Uncle Bailey, Blackman, Barnum, Batman, Apotamus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I forgot that you, one. How did you, when you, when you were trying to develop those, those strings, because they make sense. Well, I hope that they all are doing productive work as well as, um, uh, uh, being absurd and surreal. You know, one of the things that I um, loved growing up was 
uh, overt nonsense. Lewis Carroll and, um, and the poems of people like Edward Lear. And, um, and, I, and I love Dr. Seuss. And I you know, memorized some of my favorite uh, Dr. Seuss books. And there are, there are those like On Beyond Zebra where they go past just unexpected combinations of the English language and into, in a sense, a kind of new language, an invented language, which is also what Lewis Carroll does, like in a poem like The Jabberwock. Um, and I think that, uh, and of course, these things point towards, you know, some kind of high literature. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're on the road through Lewis Carroll, eventually you're going to end up at James Joyce. But I was never um, quite as exalted as that. I kind of wanted to have my regular storytelling and my nonsense at the same time. And so I loved to invent characters who would sort of represent the principle of the absurd and would speak in a, mm. in a crazy way. If you look at the books that precede my Lewis Brooklyn, there tends to be some s small part, some walk on, some minor character or small group of characters who, who kind of uh, keep alive this, this spirit of nonsense. And in a way, Motherless Brooklyn was just me calling my own bluff and saying, what if I, you know, instead of putting this character at the margins, what if I made that nonsense talker into the, the narrator of the book? What if I put them in charge of the entire language system? Um, and, you know, it was a chance to play. What you hear, you know, what you're reading aloud to me is the sound of me playing and having fun. It was a gas to write uh, mm -hmm. book, but I did have to subject them in, in revision to the pressure to make them all meaningful. You know, it was, it was in a sense, it was easy to, to, to smash syllables together. What was difficult was to resolve them in a way that um, generated uh, narrative meaning. And I, I tried I, my best to make them all meet that test. Before we leave the subject, we did get this question from several people. Jonathan, have you received any feedback from people with Tourette's? Oh, sure. I mean, it, it was an enormous part of my life for the years just following publishing this book um, and a really rewarding experience. I, I wrote it relatively incognito, although I did, um, thanks to a, incredible luck, I, was a, I was, became acquainted with Oliver Sacks, and he introduced me to a couple mm -hmm. of really eloquent and, and charming and marvelous um, uh, friends of his because they, were, they weren't really his patients. They were just people with very interesting and overt uh, cases of Tourette's who Oliver was interested in. And one in particular named Shane Fistel in Toronto, I spent some time with, and he was he wasn't so much the model for Lionel as he was my, my weather vane. He was his, his reactivity and his, the amount of language and, and behavior that he generated was so extraordinary. And he was so unembarrassed about it. He was so in a way interested in, and, 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 you know, he saw it as, as his self-definition. So he gave me a lot of permission just by his existence, but I mostly, you know, I mostly learned by reading things and it was after the book was published that I began to be, I found my life in a way surrounded by the Tourette's community because I'd, I'm grateful to say I'd, I'd done at least enough, even if I made some exaggerations or distortions, I'd done enough to clarify the one thing that they are most adamant about. And this is less a problem now because people are more mm -hmm. well informed, but it was in the 20th century, a big problem was that it was mistaken for a form of, of, emotional disorder of a, or a, a kind of madness, when in fact it's a pure neurological dysfunction. And since I'd specified that so carefully, the community of people with in Tourette's advocacy, which consists not only of the people who suffer Tourette's, but their families, often the parents are the drivers of the Tourette's advocacy community. They kind of swept me up. They were like, okay, we like your book, so now you gotta come do some work for us. <laughs> so I spent a couple of years going to a lot of conferences and sitting on panels. And often I would be the one person in a room full of people who had a, you know, a, 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 an urgent and, and heartrending reason to be there. They'd grown up with Tourette's or they'd raised a child with Tourette's and they were educating others and they mm -hmm. were also doing outreach to other people who were in this situation who were 
felt who felt isolated. And I became kind of a I, I, I'm not sure the word the word is uh, 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 ally. Ally, yes, an ally or a kind of spirit animal. I was like a, mm -hmm. a, a friend of the, the 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 Tourette's world for a while, which was incredibly rewarding for me. Mostly, I didn't talk; I listened because I, you know, mm -hmm. I'd already exhausted my real knowledge about the, their world in the book, and so everything I learned subsequently, I I almost could have written another book about that that experience. Let me ask you about some of the relationships in the book, Motherless Brooklyn, specifically between Minna and Lionel. Minna scooped up these boys, these Minna men from a, an orphanage, but there seems to be a truly, really special relationship between Lionel and Minna. And we asked our readers what they thought, if they thought Minna, despite him not being who he said he was, that Minna, had he ultimately been a positive influence on Lionel's life? And 68% said yes. 32% said no. Uh, that's that's a lot of yes, considering Minna brought Lionel into a life of organized crime. Uh, what do you think? Was Minna good for I, I, I love the I love the question. I love that we have like a an actual voting tally. I'm on the yes team. <laughs> I I um, I think that the thing about Minna is he's a he's a permission to be character. He has a strange effect where he lets other human beings exist and that he did this for Lionel who needed it i guess you'd say <laughs> more badly than than most of us although we all need this permission to be and for that as as much as frank minna is obviously yes a criminal and and also uh you know he's um he's not exactly politically correct he's um He's a chaotic character and a self-destructive character. He's uh, there's something about him that's that's lovely to me, and um, so I would probably vote vote with the majority on that one. Well, if you like numbers, I have more numbers for you. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Julia and the women in the novel. We asked our readers about halfway through, people who are reading Mothers Brooklyn, Brooklyn, where they thought Julia had something to do with her husband's death. 33% thought she was involved. 67% said she was a red herring. So we, we meet her early in the novel and then we don't, we don't hear from her again. Yeah. Was that always the choice? You know, I, I'm going to have to plead uh, improvisation. And I was learning what my story was as I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And I was still five novels in learning how to tell stories. And I think that probably there's something a little lopsided that you're detecting in that query. Uh, and as I recall, I think my feeling about Julia was that she was a victim, not a perpetrator. And that, you know, what I wanted to do with that character was in a way um, raise the specter of the, mm -hmm. the most problematic for me, part of traditional film noir or hard-boiled detective fiction, which is that there tends to be a femme fatale, you know, it often all gets pinned on the woman in the end of the story. And I thought what was interesting to me, but maybe is somewhat incomplete, it didn't become the center of this story, but the thought I was having about the femme fatale was that Julia herself had mistaken herself for one, but wasn't mm -hmm. one. That she wasn't part of the plot. She didn't have a lot of power, but she'd been cast by circumstance, tradition, by the, the figure she cuts as she moves through this world. She'd been cast in the role of the femme fatale and in a sense had drunk some of the Kool-Aid herself on that. She, she was one of the people who'd kind of fallen for that red herring along with the reader. Well, they said a lot of our listeners loved Motherless Brooklyn and have a lot of questions for you. So I'm going to get out of the way and, and ask some of their questions. Great, thank you. Uh, Katie Stanford writes, I listened to the audiobook and the narrator was excellent. Did Jonathan have a say in picking who would narrate the book? Well, you know, so this is a funny thing about this particular book. There exist, I don't know if they're easy, both easy to find anymore, two audiobooks of Mother's Brooklyn. And the first one was done by the actor uh, Steve Buscemi. 
And wow, that I like sounds that. marvelous and it was marvelous, but it also was a strange thing that is very rare nowadays, which is uh, the world of audiobooks was still uh, not as confident a, a one as it's become. And it was abridged. And they they lopped out about 25% of the, the language to make it move more quickly. So there's this wonderful <laughs> Buscemi performance on this, for me, slightly regrettable abridgment of the novel, but that's out there somewhere. I'm forgetting the name of the one that's more likely the one you refer to, which is complete. It's the whole text. And it is also extraordinary. You know, the, the, I, I, as I recall, I was given, and this is typically the case for me, and I think a lot of authors might have the same experience. I was given a kind of a menu of three or four voices and asked for an opinion on, on which person, which actor or, or voice performer ought to do it. They're always so incredibly good. I mean, any any of these people who make it their living to do audiobooks, their capacities are extraordinary. And having done a, a couple of audiobooks myself and sat at the mic and tried to make something come alive, and I know uh, mine are not as good as these as these um, these uh, voice performers' results. And so I know I know what a, what a, what a thing it is to do it right. So I'm glad you liked it. Ayaka says, I haven't seen the movie, but I understand it's very different time setting plot characters. How do you feel about that as an author? So this is another good story. I, um, I met Edward Norton when he first optioned the book, which was now uh, over 20 years ago, because it, it happened. Not, the book wasn't even published. It, it was uh, circulating in galleys and um, he became interested in it and um, and caused a movie company called New Line to acquire the rights so that he could work with it. And we had a conversation almost immediately. Uh, weirdly, it was in Toronto and it was on the set of a, a film called Death to Smoochie. Um, <laughs> and um, remember that movie? Yeah, uh, not everyone does, but um, he. Uh, remarkably had a vision from the very beginning, which was he wanted to bring the material of uh, traditional film noir, the 1950s, the detective milieu that was um, more characteristic of the kind of books that I'd grown up emulating when I wrote this book and take it out of the present day and move it into the past. And he wanted, also wanted to do uh, what he did do, which is in, introduce elements of um, gentrification and 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 urban renewal and and race into the story that weren't really anything but kind of just lurking they were they were implications maybe in the around the edges of this story um i thought this was all really thrilling and i liked it on principle too because i i usually like movies that are really different from the books that give them their source to me the, the history of people trying to make very, very faithful adaptations tends to lead to kind of stilted and uncinematic films. And I usually like it better when a director just grabs onto some elements, some images, some set pieces and makes something completely new and, uh, you know, its own, its own creature. So that then you end up with these two artifacts that are side by side and they have a relationship and it's an interesting charged relationship but they're not trying to be identical to one another because I don't think it works. I don't think books and films mm -hmm. can be identical. Donna said, I lived in Red Hook from 1978. So it was great to hear all the streets I knew before they were gentrified. And I was thinking about that. I remember for a while, the real estate industry tried to call that area Bacoca, Forum Hill. I, there was even <laughs> a Bacoca the Cafe. But Coca, uh, <laughs> when was the last time you strolled around that area? And, and what do you think about when you were in this gentrified part of Brooklyn now? You know, so it, it, in the last reply, I alluded to the way um, the film introduces thoughts about gentrification and race and urban renewal and the kind of deeper urban subjects. Those are also ones that preoccupy me. And the book I wrote immediately following Motherless Brooklyn was a book called The Fortress of Solitude, where I, mm -hmm. instead of writing a Valentine and a kind of a 
a fantasy about this place. I tried to dig into some of the extremely complex legacy of my own experience of growing up in what was Gowanus and became Borum Hill because I was very much an intimate witness to the early um, definition that became uh, the, the target of such a gigantic, and I mean, it's an overwhelming gentrification now. It's, it's been taken and made into a, a, a kind of a playground neighborhood where movie stars live. Well, you know, when I was first a kid in that, on that turf, we had as many bricked up windows and abandoned houses as we did uh, well renovated ones. And we had rooming houses on Dean Street. And it was a very, very, uh, I guess I'd say deeply mongrel neighborhood. It didn't even have a traditional name. It was South Brooklyn, or maybe it was North Gowanus, or it was just where you were when you were not yet in Park Slope or, or Brooklyn Heights. And seeing what's become of it is something that's so uh, strange and intense for me that I couldn't answer your question easily. I had to write a very long autobiographical novel to begin to say how mixed up I was and how moved I was by all of the contradictions that emerged from that experience. And there's so many good questions. I get some, I'm having a hard time uh, choosing. This This is it's sort of broad, but I think interesting. Louise on Instagram asks, how did you create such different settings? They make the book great. From the Zendo <laughs> Eastern <laughs> philosophy experience to the backseat of a car where someone's going to their certain death to the intimate spaces with Kimmery and Lionel. That's, that's great. I like that a lot. I mean, I think about settings all the time. And of course, this one, this book had a, a, a sort of a home ground, right? It was the streets mm -hmm. of the neighborhood. And it also had a, a, a house style, if you will, or a room tone. Because in the neighborhood, people talk and they talk urgently and they talk a lot and they make sarcastic jokes. And Lionel had Tourette's and people were full of insults and banter, and there was a lot of aggression. So what I did, and you know, this is something I might not have been able to enunciate at the time, but I can see it clearly in retrospect, I looked for contrast. If New York and, and the babble of voices were going to predominate in this story, then I was gonna to wanna to contrast those with um, their total opposites. So by looking for Zen Buddhism and moving the story into a, a, a you know, a Zen uh, monastery where people are trying to have a, mm -hmm. a collective silent meditation. It was a way of exemplifying and also making very funny the difference between the two. And I think I reached for that again when I moved the story to the woods, to Maine. Um, you know, I mean, one of the things growing up as a New York, basically a street kid, uh, you only know the canyon of the streets, you know? I mean, you might have a scrap, you might go to Prospect Park, but you're never out of sight of rooftops. And there can be a kind of terror of the open sky, you know? I knew a, a story about a kid when I was growing up who, whose uh, parents took him on the F train to Coney Island. And when he got out under the, under the sky on the beach, he started weeping in terror because he wasn't enclosed enough. And so Lionel is a product of this kind of, mm. uh, you know, he, he really doesn't, his body doesn't know what it's like to be out of that space. So I wanted to thrust him by putting him into coastal Maine and putting him out on that lighthouse and, you know, among those uh, evergreen trees, I wanted to, um, again, seek the contrast that would exemplify this idea about who he was. So dear sweet Lionel, we talked about what a sweetheart he was at the beginning, how much we want to root for him and how people feel warm about him. He ultimately at the end takes his revenge and he does not opt for mercy for the person who is responsible for Minna's yeah. death. Why not? That's a great question. I mean, I think that in some ways I was um, invested in the imperatives of the crime story. I thought I'd had my liberties with it, but that there ought to be 
um, you know, a pursuit of, of justice. And I, in this case, you know, uh, revenge isn't, isn't uh, inapt. There's that aspect to it too. But I also felt that this was a, um, a story about someone who was trying to uh, become a detective and become autonomous and express his devotion to, to Frank Minna. And so all of those things drove that result. Because so much of our conversation was about New York and so much about reading your book was about New York, we asked you, we always have a musical guest on our, on our book club. It's sort of a book club meets party. Um, and you said, hey, I really like $75 bill. Could that happen? So we made it happen. Um, why did you want $75 bill? Well, I just, for me, you know, I, I have eclectic musical tastes and I have a lot of favorites that date back to the era of my own growing up and to the, even the time when I was writing Motherless Brooklyn, which is a, you know, nostalgic part of my life now. But I wanted to pick something really contemporary that also connected to that time in my life. And I think you know, I was listening to bands in New York City in that period when I was writing the book that were playing small clubs and that were experimenting with incorporating world music and, uh, and avant-garde music and jazz into, um, you know, or playing those kinds of things uh, in, a, in, a, in an amalgamation in, in rock or alternative or underground settings. And um, $75 bill just seemed to me to exemplify that. I, f I can feel the thread. They're, they're very much of this moment, but they're so much like the, the city that I remember and the music that I remember, the culture that I remember at places like Knitting Factory. And, um, and you know, um, Che Chan, the guitarist, uh, worked at my favorite record store other music um and i'm so so sorry it's not there anymore and so it's it's a a way of i guess um celebrating uh a kind of music i love but also splitting the difference between um uh nostalgia and the the here and now well, thank you for the recommendation. And we're going to hear from $75 Bill in just a moment. But first, I want to say thank you, Jonathan Leatham. Thank you so much for being part of our book club. It was a real pleasure. This was a gas, Allison. Thank you so much. And to everyone who got involved and, and, and offered questions, um, it means a tremendous amount to me. Jonathan, thanks a bunch. We're moving on. $75 Bill is the duo of guitarist Che Chen and Rick Brown on percussion. They formed in New York in 2012. They've been a local favorite ever since playing places like La Poisson Rouge. In 2019 album, I Was Real was recorded in Brooklyn Studio G and landed on Pitchfork's list of the year's best experimental albums. They released music last year too, including their first live album, Live at Tubby's, which we recorded at a bar in Kingston, New York place in March of 2020. Rick, welcome. We'll put Rick Brown and Che Chen. Welcome to you as well, Che. Hi. Hi. So Che, how did you two start playing together? Oh, well, <laughs> I guess the, the answer we <laughs> like to give to is, that. <laughs> <laughs> the answer we like to give is that we met on MySpace, which certainly dates us to a certain time. But, um, I think we would have met anyway, uh, just because we both go to a lot of shows. And uh, Rick, I was in a band at the time called True Primes, and, and Rick started turning up at all our gigs. And there weren't many people that turned up at our gigs. So if you came to more than one, you were pretty conspicuous. Um, but so that's how we met. But then it, it took a number of years, actually, before we actually played together. Um, and uh, yeah, we started playing together in 2012 at a uh, at a jam session that Rick and his wife Sue would have at their their practice space that, in Greenpoint. Rick, what was it you liked about Che's playing that you kept showing up? 
everything. He and and that's what he plays everything. So I, I would go see this band, and it wasn't just Che. I mean, his partner Roland was similarly uh, attractive and really they they both what they did together was I don't know mysterious and kind of enchanting to me um, and fun and and full of a lot of different sounds. Che, over the course of seeing them, I don't know, 10 or 11 times, Che always was playing different instruments. And uh, yeah, it was that, was that depth and, or maybe not depth, but breadth uh, of what they were doing that I really uh, was attracted to. Che, how did you arrive at your sound? Oh, well, that's a big question. Um, I mean, I guess since we're talking about New York, you know, one, one of the things, you know, about, you know, they always say like Queens, it's, there's more languages spoken in Queens than, you know, highest density of different languages, you know, spoken than anywhere in the world or something like that. But I think the same is kind of true musically, you know, here, there's just, there's so many different kinds of music here. And, um, and uh, I think being able to hear that stuff in person um, and to, to be able to go see all these different kinds of music here uh, by people that are doing it at a really high level is is something really, you know, that I don't take for granted about this city, you know, and that, that if you want to learn how to, you know, play Persian music or Indian music or Haitian music, or if you want to sort of take lessons from somebody or get into that, you can do that here. And, um, you know, I think Rick and I both kind of have big sort of broad, I guess, appetites for music and, and certainly listening it, to music from all over the world and all these different kind of pockets of the underground has been a big part of, uh, I don't know, I think getting to where we are. Yeah. Sort of same question for you, Rick. How has being in New York and being a New Yorker and all that that means affected the way you are a musician? Well, it's it's crucial, obviously. And I mean, exactly what Chase said about the access. Um, I, I moved here in 1975 to go to college and uh, uh, music ended up being much more of what I uh, found <laughs> enriching to me um, than, than that experience of, of school. Um, and in, in 75, there was, a lot, there was a lot happening, a lot of different things coming together. I mean, the punk scene was, was very attractive, but also um, there, was, there was a thriving underground jazz scene in the, in the lofts and the the salsa bands were at a peak and there were there were places like casino 14 near my house that i could go and see two big latin bands a night uh ladies free <laughs> so uh it was a it was a bargain to take a date um <laughs> uh, so yeah the music scene in new york was was as a fan, because at that point I was still just uh, just somebody who was listening to music. I wasn't playing. Um, it was so exciting and enriching. I mean, I I decided to come to school in New York because I I wanted to hear be part of that. Really, of the mm -hmm. of, um, on previous visits, I had seen uh, the Jazz Composers Orchestra at uh, NYU's. Uh, student center in a, a, a great uh, workshop concert. So it was, that's what it's been for me. It's funny, we've got a comment from Betty Rocks here for this New York City music nostalgia. So <laughs> <laughs> I do wanna, let's bring it up to present day. Let's talk about Live at Tubby's, which is actually credited as $75 bill, Little Big Band. So this includes your spouses, am I right? Uh, my wife Sue is on that record. Um, the the little big band is, is a a kind of a growing and changing collection mm -hmm. of our close friends. Um, and Talis Che's wife 
has played with us, but she's not on the Tubby's record. Um, uh, that was a, an eight piece version of our group that played um, our the last gig of a, a short tour that um, Che and I had been on. Um, and it, it just happened that a bunch of our friends could make it to the to uh, Kingston to play that show with us. We were really happy that they could. And it was a loose night, but but uh, I think it comes across very well in the, re- the recording that we put out. Well, you were all kind enough to send us a performance. You and your, your, your people have all been in a pod together, in a bubble together. Mm-hmm. So don't write us, everybody. They're safe. They're being safe. Um, che, will you tell us a little bit about the song we're going to hear? Uh, yeah, the song um, to people that already know us will be very familiar <laughs> to them. It's a song called Wesson 3. Um, and the uh, another thing I should say when you were asking about influences is that I, I must give credit to um, taking guitar lessons from an incredible musician named Jay Shul Shigali from, uh, the, from Mauritania, where I went and had a very... Um, very brief sort of crash course in in Mauritanian music and uh, um, a wesin is uh, is a form there that's played um, it's like an instrumental tune uh, for people to dance to and when the singers rest their voices like at a wedding performance which is where most of Mauritanian music happens um, anyway so this is it's sort of a tip of the hat to that. We're not we're not trying to sort of emulate that music, but I, I thought the form uh, um, or the the idea of sort of an instrumental kind of um, break, if you will, was uh, appealing. So this version of the song um, is with, as you mentioned, our, our wives. So Talis Lee on violin and Sue Garner playing bass, and myself on guitar, and Rick playing uh, his plywood crate. Um, so, yeah. Well, let's hear it. Rick Brown, Che Chen of $75 Bill, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having us. Let's take a listen.
Oh, it was. Oh, yeah. It seemed oh, shorter. No, it was that was $75 bill. Now, normally we'd be wrapping up, but because this is a special We Love New York episode of Get Lit, we have a bonus. Of course, if you're talking about the great institutions of New York, you have to talk about Lincoln Center. So as the library's uh, Roar for New York uh, program was launched, we thought, let's get the folks from Lincoln Center and see what they've been up to. And they've been up to some fantastic work during the pandemic. They've come up with their own initiative to give back to New Yorkers. Love from Lincoln Center is a series of outdoor concerts, especially for frontline workers. And Lincoln Center's Senior Director of Artistic Programming, Jordana Lee, joins me now with a special announcement about it. Hi, Jordana. Hi, Allison. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and what a wonderful evening this has been. Um, your guests have been just wonderful. I've enjoyed hearing about the nostalgia of New York City and the resilience of New York City and how our artists and our community is continuing to build and rebuild. And um, it is truly a love letter to New York. Um, and what we at Lincoln Center are doing right now is trying to thank our community, be part of it, be really responsive to who how we can support people. And we have partnered um, with our official hospital, New York Presbyterian, to bring love from Lincoln Center to hospitals and to healthcare workers and essential workers. Um, that was going to be starting in the spring, as soon as it's safe for us to do that. <laughs> is it going to be uh, um, available online or is it gonna be all in person? So we're going to be working with the many resident organizations at Lincoln Center, New York Philharmonic, Chamber Music Society, and many others. And we're going to be bringing trios and quartets to hospitals. Some mm -hmm. of them will be streamed live. So we are, you know, very aware of keeping and sharing art both virtually and in person. You can check out Lincoln Center at um, lincolncenter.org to find out more information. Um, but it's really about um, sharing this art, this healing, and finding a way that we can connect with people, be it in person or virtually. How does love from Lincoln Center fit into the other ways that you as an institution and an organization and as a, a, a wonderful cultural hub have had to pivot? We've all had to make choices and new decisions and hard decisions. You know, we at Lincoln Center really see ourselves as an organization that's supposed to be supporting artists, supporting our community, and finding ways that we can really respond to how we, we do that. So we've done several different things. We've done everything from very small performances outside with first love from Lincoln Center started with one-on-one -on -one performances um, with one musician and essential worker, healthcare worker, um, mm. and bringing, that was the very first thing we did to bring music back to Lincoln Center. And that was in July. Um, we have since then been able to do a couple of other things of activating the campus, bringing small performances outside. But we also have done things like become a polling site for the election or mm. done uh, food banks um, and have actually going to be doing a blood drive soon. So we're finding ways that we can really support our community. And we know that the arts give hope. They're the reason why we wake up in the morning. Um, perhaps it's the reason that makes you think about what, you know, gives you insp inspiration for how we can get through this pandemic. And also we know the arts heal. And so bringing this love from Lincoln Center to our community, especially to those who have been working so hard to save us and to mm -hmm. keep us going um, is very important to us at this moment in time. How have you been able to do this and keep everyone safe? We've been talking to a lot of different, you know, uh, people who are involved in the arts and that's a challenge right now. Well, definitely working with our official hospital, New York Presbyterian. Um, they have given us a lot of advice mm. on how to make this work within their spaces. Uh, we have a very rigorous protocol, um, including testing and social distancing. Everyone is masked um, and really working with them to make sure that everything is as secure as possible. Um, you know, it's about communication. It's about mm -hmm. really working closely with both our partner, but also with our musicians and making sure that they feel secure and safe because 
we have to value them so much. They are so important to who we are. And that's what I I love about what we're, we're discussing here today is how the arts and our musicians and hearing the music just before by $75 um, bill and how mm-hmm. we can really, it just makes me really happy to know the arts are still alive. <laughs> We've been talking a lot on our show about the Save Our Stages acts and all of the different things, the Actors Equity Fund, the Ratatouille musical, which raised almost $2 million at this point. Um, how are things at Lincoln Center? I mean, we at Lincoln Center are um, as working as hard as everyone else to bring the arts back and to be resilient. Uh, we are thrilled to know that Congress has passed this and is finding a way to support the arts. And we're really hoping that the Save Our Stages Act will actually support everyone in the 50 states and that it will allow everyone from the really small mom pop shops that those clubs um, that where we find those artists that we can then bring to Lincoln Center are surviving as well. That's really important that our ecosystem really has the entire nourishment. And so we're Mm -hmm. thrilled that this passed. We have a performance from Love From Initiative. It was recorded last summer. What can you tell us about it? So this, as I said, was the very first time that live music came back to Lincoln Center after we shut down in March. This was in July. And you're going to see um, an artist, Quan Chin Lu, from the New York Philharmonic. He's a violinist. He is performing for two essential workers outside, um, socially distanced, everyone is masked. Mm-hmm. And the piece they're doing is the Adante from Box uh, Sonata Number no. 2 in A minor. And I have to say, I was there when this happened. It brought tears to my eyes to have oh. music to come back. And it was such an impact of what it can do. And I hope this brings a little solace and um, light to everyone as well. Lincoln Center's Jordana Lee, thank you so much for being with us. And thanks to everyone at Lincoln Center for Love From. What an amazing program. And here's the performance we were just talking about, courtesy of our friends at NPR Music.
That was Quan Chang Lu from the New York Philharmonic from Love from Lincoln Center. Thanks to Jordana Lee from Lincoln Center for being with us, as well as $75 Bill, and of course, author Jonathan Lethem. We're going to tell you about our next book club selection in just a moment. We have a couple of thank yous because we're polite around here. We want to say thank you to our partners, the New York Public Library, specifically Tony Marks, Andrew Medlar, and Brian Bannon. They get those copies of books into your hands every month, e-copies. The Green Space team pulls off all of this video magic and makes it look spectacular. That's Jennifer, Sachi, Cam, Ricardo, and David. And thanks to Team all of its Get Lit team, the producers who make this happen each and every month, Megan Ryan, Jordan Loft, and Simon Close. Okay, the January selection. We are kicking off 2021 with a real page turner, a spooky book, a book that's an original take on gothic horror, a novel that's already an option for Hulu for a limited series. We are reading the New York Times best-selling novel, Mexican Gothic by author Silvia Moreno Garcia. Here is the story. It is set in 1950s Mexico. It tells the story of Noemi, a socialite who heads to the Mexican countryside after receiving a frantic letter from her newlywed cousin who is accusing her new English husband of poisoning her. When Noemi arrives at the house called High Place, she encounters dark spirits, family secrets, and her cousin's new husband, a handsome and mysterious Englishman. But the more Noemi tries to get to the bottom of the mysteries surrounding the place, the more the house begins to take hold of her psyche. Mexican Gothic was named one of the best books of 2020 by eh, everybody. The New Yorker, NPR, The Washington Post, Vanity Fair, and a whole lot more. The Guardian says it's Lovecraft meets Brontes in Latin America. All right, here's the part that's great. And this is why it's great to have the New York Public Library as your partner. You New Yorkers, you can get an e-copy from the library. Head to wnyc.org slash get lit, or you can follow us on Instagram at all of it, WNYC, to be part of the book club. We'll also have links on ways to get the e-books from the library. Now here's where we get to meet back here again. Mark your calendars. It's going to be pretty soon, January 27th. It's our virtual event with author Silvia Moreno Garcia. Until then, everybody, please stay safe, wear a mask. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Allison Stewart. I appreciate you watching and I appreciate you. Take care.